And you don't have to do great things right where you are, no matter what your duties in life, your state in life, no matter how insignificant. The great Carmelite saint, Saint Therese, gave us her little way. She talked about the fact that she couldn't do great penances. She just wasn't able to, but so she sought to sanctify every little thing. So if she was washing the dishes, she would offer that to the Lord. And don't think that God doesn't accept those little offerings. Those are great things to God. You know how it is, moms and dads. If you have a little child, and that child, who is basically poor, doesn't have anything unless you give it to them, they bring you a little weed, a daisy or something. Well, it's not worth a heck of a lot in itself. But isn't your heart touched? Of course it is. What's important? The one who's giving you the weed. It looks like a flower to them. I used to give my mother bouquets of dandelions. <laughs> and she had hay fever. <laughs> but she loved the gift just the same. Why? Because her son gave it to her. And so it is with our Heavenly Father. We don't have a great deal to offer. Maybe, maybe we're sick. I remember a man, wonderful man, in my hometown when I was first ordained a priest and had gone home right after ordination. I visited him. He was dying of cancer in the hospital. He had his rosary and his books piled up next to him, and he said, Oh, Father, I'm, I'm so sad. All my life I've prayed the rosary every day. I've been a daily communicant for 40-some years, and I, I'm so sick. I can't pray. And, and I said, oh, Jim, don't you understand that right now from the cross your prayer is more powerful than it's ever been? Offer the good Lord every beat of your heart. Offer him every pained sigh, every blink of your eye. Offer him everything, every breath you take. And I assure you that he will accept that as a great prayer. Well, we don't have to wait until we're dying. Do it now. You can offer God everything. Every step you walk, every word you speak can be for him. And in the sanctification of little things, everyday things, you too can become a great saint. Why? Because we're in him. We're in him. And he has sent his Holy Spirit, the sanctifier, to make us just like him, the son. We become sons and daughters in the son of God, the eternal word. And so everything becomes important in our life. Christ enables us to live in him all that he himself lived, and he lives it through us. You know, it didn't end 2,000 years ago. Oh, yes, Jesus suffered and died once for all. He accomplished redemption. There's only one mediator between God and men the man Jesus Christ, but in his infinite love and mercy, he wills that we enter in to his life and mission. And so we do. We become co-redeemers in Christ, the only redeemer. He doesn't need us, but he wills that we participate in his life and in his mission. He lives through us. When we suffer, it is Jesus suffering in an extension of his passion Remember, as a divine person who acted through his human nature, that's called a theandric action in theology. That quite simply means the God-man accomplishing things. Because it, the subject of action is divine, in a sense, he's outside time and space. So what he did transcended time and space and can be made present in time and space, any time and any place. That's what the Mass is about. It's the very same sacrifice of Calvary offered in an unbloody manner, made present in time and space. We don't repeat the sacrifice. We don't repeat Christ's life. We don't repeat redemption. We enter into the life and mission and redemption of Jesus Christ and make it present at our own time in history and in our own place in the world. And that's a great mystery. Remember what we're talking about here, mystery. But mystery doesn't admit of a lesser quotient of truth. Mystery admits of a greater quotient of truth. The thing is, our finite mind 
isn't fully capacitated to embrace the fullness of that truth, that mystery. But the thing in itself is eminently true. It is very, very real. It's mystery. And so we live, we move, we have our being in Christ the Lord. Now, one of the things that we want to do, my dear brothers and sisters, in this course is, yes, we want to learn better our faith. But more than that, we want to live it. There is no dichotomy between knowing your faith and living your faith. You know, in recent years, I've heard some say, oh, you don't need to know all that theology stuff. The only thing that matters is if you love each other. That's a ridiculous statement. Uh, because if you love God and you love each other, then you should want to know the God that we purport to love. Because as you come to know him better, you will fall more deeply in love with him. Then you will make him present to your brothers and sisters. So there's no dichotomy between knowing God and loving God. The two go together. Love and truth are one in the one God. Jesus himself, who is God, said, I am the truth. St. John said of God, God is love. There's only one God. He's truth, he's love. And so don't worry that if you come to know your faith better, you're going to love less. No. There's no dichotomy, no opposition. Love him, know him. The more you know him, you should then put that knowledge into action by loving your neighbor as yourself. But first, you have to enter into union with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I hope this course will not only teach us the objective doctrine of the faith, but I hope that truth will set you free so that you can love God and your neighbor with your whole heart, mind, and strength. Because, you know, I'll tell you, uh, don't be scared when I tell you this, but I'll tell you a truth, a big truth. Knowledge brings with it an increase in responsibility. The more you know, the more you're responsible to live what you know and share what you know. Sometimes I think about, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about that and the sweat starts to <laughs> come down and I say, oh Lord, I'm lost. How can I ever, I've been graced. I, I have to admit it, I've been very fortunate, very blessed to be given the gift of faith, no merit of my own, that's for sure, that's a gift. Faith is a gift. We're all given that gift in varying degrees. God's been generous with me, and he's given me a good education. Very few people have had the education I've had, not because I'm any good and not because I'm smart, I'm not, but because of God's grace. But that gift, every gift, carries with it a commensurate responsibility to correspond to the grace of the gift. The gospel tells us, to those who have been given much, much will be required. To the man who is given more, more will be required. It is a great blessing to receive more, but it carries a tremendous responsibility. So, we learn the faith, but then what? then we have to go out and witness to it powerfully. How do you do that? By the way you live. You don't have to preach on a street corner, but I'll tell you every place you are, if you are living the life of Christ intently, then people will look at you and they will say, so that's what a Christian is. I remember a friend of mine had that said of him. He'd been a lay evangelist for some time, and he one day he did some great work of charity. It cost him a lot and sacrifice. And an atheist looked at him in wonder and shook his head and he said, so that's what a Christian is. Now I know. And you know, the whole world should be able to say that about every, every one of us. You know, if Catholics are just like the rest of the world, there's something very wrong. Catholics should witness to and manifest the love of Jesus Christ, which is self-sacrificing love, should witness to the fullness of truth and the reason that the doors aren't being knocked down 
in Catholic parishes all over the world is because I'm not doing my job well enough, and neither are you, but God ain't finished with us yet.